Tonight, Canada's inflation fight. Overall, prices are falling while others keep surging. Spending more up the food chain. Our grocery bills probably tripled. Financial pain and the calls to give shoppers more options. Vladimir Putin's new message after the mutiny. It has shaken the Russian leadership. The whereabouts of a mercenary leader and why NATO is concerned. We have already increased our readiness, our uh, preparedness. Plus, shining a spotlight on Tourette's syndrome. You may see me twitching a little bit up here. Singer Louis Capaldi calls off his concert tour and raises awareness. Oh, but instead I only wish you the best. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. There is new evidence tonight of a fact many grocery shoppers already knew. Too much concentration is leading to higher prices at the checkout. The report by the Competition Bureau points out that in 1986, when the Competition Act was introduced, there were eight large grocery chains in Canada, each owned by a different company. Today, there are five. And the three largest, Loblaws, Sobeys, and Metro, own or are affiliated with a thousand stores each nationwide. Despite the persistent sting on food costs, new figures today show inflation is down to 3.4 percent. CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver with the bottom line and what it means for you. Inflation is trending down, now at the lowest rate in two years, but the economy is still too hot. And really where we want to see consumers sort of slow down their spending, we're not seeing uh, much signs of deceleration. The big changes, an 18.3% drop in gasoline prices and an 11.5% reduction in childcare costs. But there was also a 29.9% increase in mortgage interest costs and a 9% increase in grocery prices. Even for a couple with no kids, our grocery bills probably tripled. The month isn't even over yet and I've spent $1,448 and I have no food. While the inflation rate is coming down, grocery prices are bucking the trend. When inflation peaked this time last year, a watermelon cost $5.99. Now it's $7.99. And a package of organic chicken that was $8.99 a pound is now $10.99 at the same store. Benjamin Allen grows tomatoes and cucumbers in giant greenhouses. He says that despite efforts to conserve energy and buy in bulk, the cost of natural gas, electricity and supplies like cardboard have gone way up. We don't want to gouge our customers, but we still need to make a living and pay bills. To help bring down the high food costs, a new report by the Competition Bureau says Canada needs more independent and international grocers. Right now, the majority of consumers buy their food from stores owned by Loblaws, Sobeys and Metro, who combined earned more than $3.6 billion in profits last year. We know that competition works over time to lower prices and increase choice for consumers, and ultimately that's what we're trying to do by um, uh, recommending ways to inject more competition into the sector. To change the grocery landscape, the Competition Bureau suggests governments look at making regulatory reforms or introducing incentives, including financial incentives, that make Canada Omar a more attractive place for international investors. All right, Annie, thanks. To Ukraine now, where Russian missiles have struck the eastern city of Krematorsk. Not, nod your head if you can hear us. At least four people were killed, according to Ukrainian officials, and more than 40 others injured in the daytime attack on a restaurant and shopping center. It comes as Russian President Vladimir Putin celebrated his security forces for averting a civil war after a mercenary mutiny. CTV's Adrian Gobriel on where the leader of that rebellion is tonight. At a fine display inside the Kremlin, as President Vladimir Putin walks the red carpet after narrowly avoiding bloodshed in the streets of Moscow. Praising members of his security forces, Putin proclaimed that his military stopped a civil war following the withdrawal of the once Russian-backed Wagner Company, who were destined for that country's capital just days ago. As for the whereabouts of Wagner's chief, Yevgeny Prigozhin, the warlord behind the short-lived mutiny on Moscow, has arrived safely in Belarus. 
Yes, indeed, he is in Belarus today, confirmed President Alexander Lukashenko, who touted the expected arrival of additional Wagner forces in his country as a positive. The potential movement of the mercenary militia into Belarus, sparking a sharp response from neighboring Baltic nations and NATO. If Wagner deploys its serial killers in Belarus, all neighboring countries face even greater danger of instability. We have already increased our readiness, our uh, preparedness and uh, uh, our military presence in the eastern part of the alliance. As NATO Eastern Bloc countries work to fortify their borders inside Ukraine, the recent revolt against Putin and the Russian establishment is being seen as a predictable outcome. It has always been pretty obvious that uh, it's just a matter of time when someone in Russia will dare to challenge Putin. Prigozhin is just the first one who, who dared, uh, but I have no doubt that others will follow. Should the quickly evolving conflict result in Wagner forces approaching NATO borders, Western allies, including the Canadian military already in the region, could be called upon. Omar. All right, Adrian, thank you. Back in this country, there is another kind of war. New numbers from two different provinces paint an ominous picture of Canada's efforts to battle opioid deaths. As CTV's Alberta Bureau Chief Bill Fortier reports, they're soaring. Need a hand? What's going on? In Canada's big cities and small communities, drug overdoses are an increasingly troubling issue. Have you overdosed today? Newly released numbers show Alberta saw its worst month ever for opioid deaths in April. 179 people died. The past years have been very difficult for people who use drugs, for their families. While the city of Lethbridge has about 2% of Alberta's population, it saw more than 10% of April's opioid-related deaths. We want more harm reduction services, we want more treatment services, we want more transitional housing. And the problem is nationwide. A new report shows the rate of young Ontarians who died from drug overdoses tripled from 2014 to 2021. That um, suggests that perhaps this is a demographic that isn't getting access to the treatment they need. It took just one overdose three years ago to scare Pathrina Anderson away from fentanyl. She spent four days in hospital. And when I got out, I just like, I threw everything out. I took all my paraphernalia to the trash. In Alberta, the government has moved away from supervised drug consumption sites towards rehab. Now, Albertans who are facing addictions and homelessness at the same time to have an appropriate place to safely recover uh, and to be able to move on with their life. This Edmonton ICU doctor says that's the wrong move, insisting addiction is a mental health disorder and needs to be treated as one. I think we have spent a lot of time demonizing this so that we don't have to look at the problem square in the face. Some experts believe there needs to be a combination of treatment and supervised places for people who are still using drugs. We need to find a way not to necessarily get young people into treatment, but to make the treatment appropriate for those young people seeking help. And doctors say that solution is urgently needed. In the first four months of this year, Alberta saw 613 opioid deaths. That's more than five per day. Omar. That devastating number far higher when you factor in the entire country. All right, Bill, thanks. The unprecedented wildfires burning in Canada for weeks have now affected the air in Europe. NASA released satellite images today showing plumes of smoke drifting over Portugal, Spain and France and extending further north. The air quality was affected even more in parts of North America. This was the Chicago skyline today. It's burning on the eyes and burning in the nose. I'm glad that my son is not out in it because he does have severe asthma. And New Yorkers were warned to expect hazy skies once again from the wildfires starting tomorrow. It's clear how those wildfires are impacting the world and so is deforestation. New research revealed today shows the world lost 41,000 square kilometers of tropical forests in 2022. Now to put that into perspective, that's the equivalent of 11 soccer fields per minute. This despite climate goals by countries including Canada. Today, the federal government launched a first of its kind adaptation strategy. CTV's BC Bureau Chief Melanie Nagy has the highlights. Fierce wildfires devouring large swaths of land. Smoke smothering several cities. 
rising rivers prompting flooding. In recent weeks, Canada has been hard hit by severe climate events. Canada's climate is changing. Today in Vancouver, the federal government finalized its strategy aimed at helping Canadians better prepare for more frequent and unpredictable climate-related disasters. While we must reduce our emissions to keep the climate from getting worse, we must also make our communities more resilient to the impacts of climate change. A draft of the National Adaptation Strategy, as it's called, was first revealed last year after Fiona ravaged Atlantic provinces. The latest version affirms targets including shortening timeframes for displaced individuals to return home after climate change disasters like wildfires. In the fire-destroyed town of Lytton, B.C., people are still out of their homes nearly two years later. The strategy not only touches on rebuilding climate-impacted communities, but ensuring new infrastructure better protects people. Those buildings need to be able to provide us with the appropriate level of heating or cooling. In 2021, a sweltering heat dome killed more than 600 British Columbians. It was one of the deadliest weather-related events in Canadian history. The extreme weather is coming. It's going to get more challenging going forward, and we need to prepare more rapidly. As part of its plan, Ottawa wants to eliminate deaths due to extreme heat by 2040. While it's unclear how exactly that will be achieved, the B.C. government has announced it will spend $10 million on air conditioners for the vulnerable. Through this program, people will be able to apply through B.C. Hydro to be considered for free air conditioning units. The province says it expects to distribute about 8,000 air conditioners in the next three years. Melanie Nagy, CTV News, Vancouver. This was the first full day on the job for the mayor-elect of Canada's largest city. Olivia Chow's victory is historic, and so are the challenges. Here is CTV's Heather Wright. Olivia Chow walked into City Hall this morning for the first time as mayor-elect. Thank you, Toronto! After winning last night's by-election, vowing to build a better city. I want to get started immediately to make life more affordable. But people aren't the only ones facing a cash crunch. Toronto's budget shortfall is more than a billion dollars, and digging out won't be easy. I will have to talk to the senior staff, talk to other councillors, and see if we could persuade the federal and the provincial government to partner with us. Chow is the first racialized woman to take on Toronto's top job. A former city councillor and member of parliament, she is also the widow of former NDP leader Jack Layton. During the campaign, her conservative opponents warned Chow would go on a spending spree. Ontario Premier Doug Ford said she'd be an unmitigated disaster as mayor. During the election, you throw some mud back and forth, but I'll tell you one thing, people, uh, people expect us to work together and that's exactly what we're going to do. And that's what voters expect, with the city, like most of the country, mired in a housing and cost of living crisis. She has a lot of issues facing her, and she has a short duration to be able to galvanize support. This was an unconventional race, 102 candidates on the ballot, in a by-election called after former Mayor John Tory resigned over an affair with a staffer. Chow's win as a progressive brings to end a decade of conservative rule at City Hall. But change won't happen quickly. There's a lot of inertia. So what you did before, you can try to modify a bit. You can try to shift the direction somewhat. But look, housing is still going to be a problem in this city. Olivia Chow says she is ready to raise property taxes, which are some of the lowest in the region. But the exact figure won't be determined until next year. Heather Wright, CTV News, Toronto. The two largest newspaper chains in Canada are in merger talks. North Star Capital, which owns the Toronto Star, and Post Media, which controls 130 publications, including the National Post, Vancouver Sun, and Calgary Herald, are negotiating, saying the media industry faces an existential threat. The deal has not been finalized. Time for a break, but when we come back, Canadian content for a billionaire's cage match, plus record money for a Gustav Klimt masterpiece. A British actor was confirmed to have died today, five months after he went missing. Julian Sands was best known for his role in the Oscar-winning film A Room with a View. He went for a hike in January in the San Gabriel Mountains north of Los Angeles and never returned. The cause remains under investigation. Sands was 65.
Pop star Louis Capaldi has canceled the rest of his international tour to focus on his struggle with Tourette syndrome after he fell silent at a major music concert. But as CTV's Jill Makishan reports, since the 26-year-old revealed his diagnosis, his voice for advocacy is louder than ever. When one of the biggest pop stars in music today couldn't finish this hit song at a concert, his fans did it for him. Louis Capaldi is living with Tourette's syndrome, speaking for the first time publicly a few months ago. You may see me twitching a little bit up here. A neurological disorder with no known cure. For years, the Scottish musician who lived with the tics of Tourette's believed he was suffering from a mental health crisis. My anxiety is out of control. Documented in a new film about his rise to fame. In a statement, Capaldi said he was stepping away from his concert tour to concentrate on his health. I'm still learning to adjust to the impact of my Tourette's and on Saturday it became obvious that I need to spend much more time getting my mental and physical health in order so I can keep doing everything I love for a long time to come. Capaldi is one of many celebrities to speak out about the impact of this condition. American singer Billie Eilish was diagnosed with Tourette's as a child and Canadian actor Seth Rogen went public on Twitter two years ago. That uh, increases awareness of uh, the disorder, uh, which really helps, I think, hopefully to um, reduce stigma. Speaking about his own health challenges, Capaldi said many people have reached out to him with their stories. Nice people have been coming to me and being yeah. like, oh, I really resonate with it. And I guess that's the that. most important thing. And for Capaldi, most important is his health now. But he has promised to return to his passion, his music, as soon as he can. Jill Mackishon, CTV News, Winnipeg. Somebody. The most expensive artwork ever auctioned in Europe sold for $142 million Canadian. So, congratulations. Lady with a Fan was Austrian artist Gustav Klimt's final masterpiece and was still on the easel in a studio when he died in 1918. The buyer is a collector from Hong Kong. The prizes on one of television's longest-running game shows are not quite as valuable, but still potentially life-changing. And now we know that Ryan Seacrest will be taking over as host. Pat Sajak, who has been host of Wheel of Fortune since 1981, announced earlier this month he's leaving the show next year. And that's when Seacrest will start. He left his co-hosting duties on Live with Kelly and Ryan, but still plans to continue on American Idol. Today, he wrote, he's truly humbled and looks forward to spinning the wheel alongside the great Vanna White. Hello, 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 and welcome to Wheel. White, who has stepped in as host a few times, is under contract for another year, but still hasn't signed an extension. Still ahead, what's in a name? The Regina Mayor meets Regina Mayor. We'll explain after the break. A well-known businessman and TV personality in Quebec has been charged with criminal harassment. Vincenzo Guzzo, the Dragon's Den investor and Montreal cinema mogul, was arrested on Friday. He's accused of criminally harassing a person for nearly eight months and allegedly ignoring a restraining order. Guzzo pleaded not guilty in court and has since been released on bail. A Texas woman who gained some Twitter fame because of an entertaining Canadian coincidence was here in person today. It all began with Regina Mayer being wrongly tagged as Regina's mayor, Sandra Masters, who is not on Twitter. That prompted Mayer, the one from Texas, to put out a matter-of-fact response that she was not the mayor. I promise you and my parents named me Regina Mayer. They had no idea there was a town <laughs> named Regina in Canada that I could be considered the mayor of someday. And so we're milking this 15 minutes for all it's worth from my perspective. <laughs> the misdirected tweets caught the attention of the real mayor who extended an invitation. She was mm -hmm. uh, in Toronto at meetings and she felt since she was in Canada, why wouldn't she just, you know, pop over pop to Regina? Pop on over to pop Regina. On over to Regina. The visitor plans to see the Royal Saskatchewan Museum and explore the city while she is here. And that could get confusing. And an 88-year-old man who waited 70 years for his diploma finally got his moment today. You are part of the Malvern class of 2023, and it is my honour to present you 
with your high school diploma from Malvern. Ted Smith graduated from a Toronto high school with the class of 2023 after a lifetime of career achievements in policing and teaching. He offered these words of wisdom to his fellow graduates. Don't give up on yourself. Never. You might get an opportunity you never ever expected, just as I did. And if it's something you really want to get into, then for crying out loud, go for it. Great advice. Congratulations, Ted. After the break, two tech giants, one cage match. This would be the biggest fight ever in the history of the world. A Canadian fighting champion's offer to Elon Musk in a proposed battle against Mark Zuckerberg. Social media platforms fight for your attention, but now the heads of two tech giants may start throwing punches for real. What started online might now be spilling into reality, and a Canadian legend of the octagon wants to get involved. Here's CTV's Quebec Bureau Chief Genevieve Beauchemin. In the unlikely battle of online billionaires, a heavyweight of the fighting world sided with Twitter's Elon Musk. The pride of Saint Isidore, Quebec, Georges Saint Pierre, GSP, regarded by many as the greatest fighter in mixed martial arts history, wrote to Musk. I'm a huge fan of yours, and it would be an absolute honor to help you and be your training partner for the challenge against Zuckerberg. Okay, let's do it, was the reply. At Meta, we're focused on. Now, in case you've missed all of this, the two tech rivals, Musk and Zuckerberg, generally weigh in on less physical pursuits, but they set up a fight on the social media feeds they run. Musk tweeting about Zuckerberg, I'm up for a cage match if he is, LOL. And Zuckerberg posting this response on his Instagram, send me location. Yeah, Musk and Zuckerberg have always had pure hatred of each other. Going back for years, I mean, this is really going back to ancient Rome. I mean, uh, Coliseum type stuff. The Zuck does train in jiu-jitsu, while Musk admits he doesn't hit the gym much. His mom May is even pushing for a verbal fight, funniest takes all. But UFC President Dana White is seemingly taking this on. I was talking to both Elon and uh, Mark last night. Both guys are absolutely dead serious about this. This would be the biggest fight ever in the history of the world. That uh -oh. remains to be seen, perhaps on pay-per-view, and many hope for charity. Into his locker room after a Regardless, it does appear GSP will be a big asset as a trainer in Musk's corner if this does play out in a Las Vegas octagon. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. We shall see. And that's a snapshot this Tuesday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching, and good night.